When you look at earliest Christian art, you notice that there's no really representatives, representations of Jesus before about the year 200, apart from symbols. There's no representations of Jesus crucified before about the year 400. And you're not going to get Jesus rising from the dead before about 700. And if you wonder, you know, what's slowing them down? Reasons given don't make much sense. Well, they didn't have enough money to do it. But come on, you know, a parchment edition of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John costs much more than something you can draw on a wall. So why does it take them so, why is it until about the year 700, you don't get any representations of Jesus rising from the dead? The reason is because they have to know how you do it. How do you actually show somebody who's a human being and divine at the same time? How do you draw it? The Romans did it by showing the emperor nude, for example. And everyone understood what it meant. How do you do that with Jesus? How do you show the risen Jesus? So when you start getting images of Jesus, you're getting a profound theological package with it. Because they have to know before they can do it, how do I draw the risen Lord? You can't just show him you know, walking around with a smile on his face or something, looking happy. How do I do it? How do I hold on to both the crucifixion and the resurrection? Well, if I show him, for example, with the wounds on his hands, as you do in Christian gospel, Christian mysticism, Christian art, well, that sort of holds it together. He's clearly crucified, but he's not on the cross. So, there's a huge difference between Western art iconography and Eastern art iconography the Western tradition, Western and Eastern Christian traditions, in trying to show the resurrection. It's a profound difference. And I think we in the West have lost something profound in going our way. In the West, in the Western artistic tradition, Jesus is shown rising from the dead alone. He's coming out of the tomb He's coming out of the sarcophagus, however it's shown. There may be soldiers at his feet or something. But he's coming up magnificent and alone. Some of the depictions, he is, he is gorgeous. It's a little bit like an athlete coming out of the gym, all beautifully muscled. But he's coming out alone. That's the Western tradition. In the Eastern tradition, Jesus doesn't rise alone. The resurrection is never something just that happens to Jesus. Jesus is always rising with a whole crowd of people behind him. Who are they? Who are these people who are coming out? Now, they are behind Jesus. He's not just one of the crowd. He's leading them out, but it's never alone. So Western tradition, you have a kind of individual resurrection. Eastern tradition, Eastern Christian, Orthodox tradition, we would say today, but I'm talking now of the Eastern tradition even before that. Jesus rises at the head of the phrase that's used is, them that slept. Who are these people? What's, what's at stake here? Now, by the way, you still do get vestiges, traces, as it were, hanging on by its fingertips of that idea of what I'm going to call the communal resurrection from the Eastern tradition in the West. And in the West, we call it the harrowing of hell. Harrowing is an old English word that means robbing. So it's the robbing of he hell or Hades or Shoal. And we sort of took it away on Holy Saturday. So Jesus has a terrible day on Good Friday, day of torture, crucifixion, very busy day on, on Easter Sunday, and sort of like the harrowing of hell is something to keep Jesus busy on Saturday. What's at stake here? What's the difference? Now make no mistake about it. In the Eastern tradition, in the, the tradition of Eastern Christianity, they say their resurrection, hey Anastasis, above this communal resurrection. So what's at stake in it? The earliest, and I'm talking about that date 700, the very earliest images we have of the resurrection itself, artistic images of the resurrection, which means that somebody had to think how do I do this? How do I portray the risen Lord? I'm not talking about simply 
apparitions to Mary Magdalene or to the apostles. I'm talking about if your job is to show Jesus coming out of the tomb, what do you do? Suppose that's your assignment. From the emperor, the new Christian emperor, you have to show me Jesus coming out of the tomb. What are you going to do? How do you tell people what it is? Let me focus on the East for a while. The West we know. Jesus comes out of the tomb by himself. The East. I'm calling it the communal resurrection, not just the individual resurrection. Jesus is always shown coming out at the head of all the dead, the just, and the martyrs who have gone before him. And you suddenly realize this is terribly close to the Jewish tradition from which Christianity eventually sprang. Because they would say, Come on, Jesus is not the first Jew who died on the Roman cross. He's certainly not the first Jewish martyr. How can you talk about Jesus rising all by himself? Did God just invent justice and it's all about the future? What about the huge backlog of injustice before Jesus? Don't tell me, they might say, about a God who is just for the future and starts with Jesus. What about the backlog? So when you look at the Eastern tradition, consistently, across hundreds of years, you can watch an image growing. The first stage of the image is what I'm going to call approaching. Jesus is shown, he's carrying the cross, usually I mean a symbolic cross, not a real wooden, big wooden cross. He's carrying the cross, you can see the wounds on his hands, and he's bending down like this to lead some people out of Sheol, out of Hades, out of hell, by whatever name. He's leaning down sort of tenderly. He's not just walking away, he's leaning out and he's reaching out to touch them. And you suddenly realize the first person he's touching is Adam. And right beside Adam stands Eve. Now, I don't think in the Western tradition we'd ever have imagined that, that the first and most important person to rise with Jesus is Adam. Isn't he a baddie? Isn't he who caused all the trouble? And if Adam and Eve arise with Jesus, who doesn't? If Adam and Eve rise with Jesus, who doesn't? And they are the first two shown. It's like, remember that image on the, the Sistine Chapel when God reaches out to create Adam and their fingers almost touch but don't quite. But now instead of this, in the recreation, the resurrection, Jesus grasps Adam by the wrist. They're not just touching, he's pulling him, he's yanking him out of the grave. So the first two, Adam and Eve are always there and Jesus is reaching down. The next time you find that image as it grows, Jesus is kind of pulling them behind him. He's marching off with them. He's kind of departing. He's still pulling at him in the back here, and Eve is right with him. And other figures start appearing with them. The next two that appear are David and Solomon. You know David because he has a beard. Solomon is beardless. They have crowns on their heads, so you recognize them. And they're probably in there because of the Old Testament, but I also suspect they're in there because kings are financing a lot of these images, so they like to have themselves in there. So Adam and Eve, David and Solomon. And the last two recognizable, of the six characters that are recognizable, are Abel, the first martyr of the Old Testament, and John the Baptist, the first martyr of the New Testament. And again, the martyrs are important. So, Jesus is either approaching, he's departing, or sometimes he's looking out at us, he's holding on to Adam, never lets Adam go, and he's looking out at us. And in the final images, it's what I call Jesus as an equal opportunity yanker. He's got Adam with one hand, Eve with the other, pulling them right out of the, the graves. And behind them come, recognizably still, David and Solomon, John the Baptist, Abel. So of the whole crowd who arise with Jesus, these are the six characters. And it's, it's not about the harrowing of hell. It always says across the top, hey Anastasis, the resurrection. When you, when you think of this, why did we lose all of that? And what have we lost? If you walk into the little chapel of the, the resurrection inside the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, there's a, a banner there that's carried around the, the church during Easter, it says, Christus Anaste, Christ is risen. And then in the middle you have a little medallion, diamond-shaped medallion. Christ is reaching down 
and four characters. He's reaching towards four characters, and you recognize them. Adam and Eve, Adam with his long, long beard, and then Eve up right behind them, and then on the other side, the first two martyrs, Abel. Abel's always shown with his shepherd's staff, and John the Baptist with his long kind of beard and ragged clothes. Now, when I look at that, and to tell you, above my desk at home, I have that final image of what I call the equal opportunity yanker from the Cora Museum in Istanbul, where the whole crowd is there, and Adam and Eve get each get a single hand from Jesus. And I try to ask myself, the people who drew that, the people whose theology was packaged in that image, did they take that all literally? We so easily think of the Jesus rising, of course, and we can imagine an empty tomb, and we can take it all literally, and we can ask questions like, well, if, if um, you had a camera crew out front, would you be able to catch all of this on tape? We can ask that question. But if these people took that literally, then there'd be hundreds, thousands of empty tombs all over Jerusalem. All the just have arisen. So they can't be taking it literally. So what's the point of it? The point of it is this. How dare you speak about the justice of God as if it started with Jesus? How dare you speak of the justice of God for the future and ignore the backlog of injustice for the past? Any Jewish person would have said that in the first century. A God who just takes care of Jesus is, is about nepotism or filiotism. It's not about justice. So, there has to be a great cleanup of the past as well. Now, I'm not taking it literally. I cannot take it literally. And I do not think they took it literally. But they are saying, you cannot ever speak of justice for the future without starting and handle justice about the past. There has to be, as it were, a great peace and reconciliation commission for the future. So when you're imagining the resurrection, the, the East doesn't just talk about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Yes, of course, Jesus is leading them out. As I say, he's never one of the crowd. He's always in the front. And he's the one reaching out to Adam and Eve and the others. But he never rises alone. So the point we're getting, the theology we're getting, is that the justice of God must reach into the past. And when we try to collaborate with the justice of God and make the earth a just place, then we have to admit at least that all those who have ever lived for justice in the past or died from injustice in the past, all of those who stood for nonviolence and died from it in the past were right. That's what we must admit. We cannot simply talk about the future and ignore the past. The resurrection is about the great divine cleanup of the world, past, present, and future, but only again with our collaboration. It's never just about Jesus. It's always about the community of all of those who have lived for justice and died from injustice.